The arts in the Persian period derived from the many earlier cultures of the Near East and were marked by more magnificent polish than by originality. Uh, so we can't give them a lot of credit for their artistic uh, work. The best preserved Persian monument is the secluded royal fortress and treasury of Persopolis. This is crazy. Listen to this. On a majestic site over a mile high, Darius built a great terrace from 512 uh, B.C. This he and his successors adorned with a maze of staircases, palaces, colonnaded audience halls, and other buildings. The whole structure was about twice the size of the Acropolis at Athens, and the contrast between Persopolis and the sacred hill of Athens illuminates sharply some fundamental differences between the Greeks and the Persians. While the Parthenon and other temples of the Acropolis were erected in honor of the patron deities of a free citizenry, the complex of Persopolis celebrated the greatness of the King of Kings. So there we might give one or two extra points to the religious people as against the secular people who worship their king. The religious people worshiping gods that were nothing other than big humans in the sky and the secular people worshiping a human who they thought was more than human. Very different, very different. His titles appear on the window sills. He himself was depicted on his throne on the door jams, supported by figures representing the satrapies. The staircases were adorned with repetitious scenes from the New Year's festival, especially processions of lively Persian and Median courtiers and guards, and also lines of envoys with the taxes and tribute of the empire. You would want to have that around your palace, wouldn't you? We're going to read the footnote here. The great audience hall of Darius was approached by two staircases, each with exactly the same decorated surface of some 300 feet. The plastic quality of the figures was probably due to Greek influence and even to Greek workmen, but they were not encouraged to enliven the rather tubular, simplified bodies. Originally, the relief glittered with such bright colors as turquoise, blue, scarlet, emerald green, purple, and yellow. All right, skipping down a bit. The art of Persopolis is, at first sight, impressive in its majesty, but beside the graceful, dynamic, humane feeling imparted by the Parthenon reliefs, the spirit of the Persian work is solemn, static, and purely decorative. On the Persopolis reliefs, true, there is a rich diversity of local costumes, befitting the great variety of the Near Eastern peoples, whereas the Athenian men and women of the Parthenon frieze unified in the spirit of the polis, are externally alike. Yet these latter figures are moved by a spiritual force which is totally absent in the Persian parades. The grandeur of the Persopolis nonetheless manifests the mammoth strength of a great empire which was a serious threat to the disunited Greeks. Now, first contact with the Greeks, 547 to 490 BC. When Cyrus conquered Lydia, that's the state that first coined coins. His general Harpagus drove on to the Aegean coast and annexed all the Greek cities of the area, which were unable to form a united front against the threat. Their appeal to Sparta brought no practical help. The citizens of Phocaea and Teos abandoned their homes and settled in the western Mediterranean and the north Aegean coast. Individual poets, philosophers, and artists sought freedom in Greece or in South Italy. But the bulk of the Greek population clung to their old homes. To supervise the cities, the Persians installed tyrants who were subject to the Persian satraps at Sardis and Dasclium. Uh, D-A-S-C-Y-L-I-U-M. Let me skip just a bit. The strength of the Persian realm soon led it to extend its rule across the Hellespont into Europe proper, up in Macedonia. In particular, Darius himself conducted a great expedition northward across the Danube in 513. But his effort to conquer the Scythians shattered on the great open plains of South Russia where the nomads could avoid a set battle. Darius's army lost heavily and barely managed to make its way back to the bridge of boats constructed across the Danube. Persian mastery, however, was extended along the north coast of Asia as far as the tributary kingdoms of Macedonia. Couldn't... Uh, a big empire, he thought he was everything. 
and as he goes north, starts realizing he's in a big freaking world here. Really big world. And uh, as big as his empire is and as powerful as he is, he's got to get back to the other side of that Bosporus. Now there's an ambitious uh, tyrant named Aristagoras of Miletus. And uh, in 499 BC, a revolt broke out against the Persian rule of all these uh, used-to-be Greek city-states. Uh, the city-states weren't as prosperous under Persian rule, and the people were probably chaffed at their lack of independence. Now, they expelled the Persian tyrants, and then they asked Sparta and other free Greek cities, city-states, to help them. Sparta wouldn't help. Uh, they didn't want to commit so far from home, but Athens sent 20 warships to help them. Herodotus says, quote, This was the beginning of ills between the Greeks and the barbarians. With this aid and with five ships from Eretria on the island of Euboea, the Ionians first seized the offensive in 498 and made a lightning attack on Sardis, which they burned. Then the Athenians withdrew, and the Greeks of Asia Minor passed to the defensive, despite the advice of the clearer-sighted Hecateus that they become masters of the sea. So you better have a good navy and be ready. But they just got on the defensive. Slowly but inexorably, the Persians reconquered first the island of Cyprus, which had also revolted. Then Caria, and finally in 495, defeated the League Navy at Led, L-A-D-E, laid off Miletus after the Samian and Lesbian contingents deserted. To teach the Greeks a lesson, Miletus itself, the largest city of the whole Aegean, was destroyed the next year. I've got a video in my favorites called uh, Ionian Itinerary, or Itinerary in Ionia. Excellent. It's got a lot about the city of Miletus there. The son-in-law of Darius, Mardonius, consolidated Persian rule along the north coast of the Aegean, though a Persian fleet was lost at Mount Athos in bad weather. In 490, a moderate-sized expeditionary force under Datis and Artaphernes was dispatched across the Aegean to punish Eretria and Athens. Uh, we're going to get now from Sprog L. de Camp, Ancient Engineers. We just got one page, uh, page, starting on page 87. We just want to talk a bit about the technology of the Greeks and the technology of the Persians in this battle. Uh, the, the engineering of their different military strengths. Luck and technology came to the aid of the Athenians. The invincible Persians depended on foot archers and cavalry. The archers, shooting from behind a palisade of wicker shields, softened up the foe. Then the horsemen swarmed out and cut the enemy to pieces. That's how the, the Persians uh, fought. Now remember the Athenians, the Greeks generally don't have horses. Horses are very, very useful, excellent commodity in war, and they just didn't have the feed. In the absence of good forage, they couldn't afford horses. Uh, but the Persians had a lot of horses. That was the Persians, and that's not how they fought at Marathon. We're going to get to how they fought at Marathon in a bit. But generally, they uh, attacked with a lot of arrows, then uh, swarmed out from behind their in infantry with cavalry, and, uh, and cut everything to pieces. Now, the Greek bronze smiths had already developed a new suit of armor for the Greek heavy infantry, or hoplites. A bronze and helm with a towering horsehair crest and projections to guard the nose, cheeks, and neck protected his head. Going up against soldiers who have nothing, nothing on their heads. A bronze cuirass, molded to fit his manly form, included, enclosed his torso. A kilt of leather straps studded with bronze buttons warded his loins, while bronze and greaves protected his legs. His shield was a circular structure of wood and leather, a yard across, with a facing of thin bronze. The Greek soldier's main offensive weapon was a short stabbing spear. He used his short, broad chopping sword only when his spear was lost or broken. The Persians had no such panoply. Later in Xerxes' time, they began to fit heavy cavalry with skirts of iron scale mail, but it is unlikely that any of Darius's soldiers were so equipped. Most of them probably went into battle simply in their uniform hat, coat, and trousers, with a spear and a buckler. In addition to the Greeks, the Assyrians before them 